So hey everybody, uh, welcome to another episode of Widgets and Wonders. This is my uh, weekly show about great products from small companies. And I'm coming at you this week with another um, designer interview. I'm here with Alex Cheng uh, from Cardboard Dynamo. And Alex is doing a crowdfund for his fighting robot, um, sort of, how would I call it? Fighting robot board miniature hybrid game called Giga Robo. Um, and you'll have seen uh, this being played already on my channel and on Gaming with the Cooler. Uh, and we've um, had a great time putting together the models, painting them all up uh, and checking out the game. But uh, Alex is here to give you guys some background info about the uh, the game itself and what he's doing. So so who and what is Cardboard and Dynamo? What's, uh, what's your history with tabletop games and, and what kind of mission are you on? Uh, Cardboard Dynamo is uh, essentially, I guess the self-publishing brand that I have with uh, Stephen Hammerschlag, who's the actually the co-developer of Giga Robo. Um, yeah, we've been working on ideas. I mean, it originally started with Giga Robo about three years ago uh, when we immediately started collaborating on it. And, you know, we knew we were going to be pushing it or trying to push it uh, to become an actual, you know, release commercial product and try to put it into retail. Um, and that's essentially what Cardboard Dynamo is. Uh, there are other people who are helping, specifically Josh Stevens, um, Alec Boyle, and we often collaborate with uh, these two fellow game designers in Chicago, uh, Roderick Magsino and Will Cox, who are uh, awesome guys and extremely talented. Um, my history with the tabletop, my history with tabletop is really, uh, it's actually kind of recent, which is, is very odd. Um, so I, I guess traditionally throughout the majority of my life, I've been more focused on video games. Um, but when I was a little kid, my mom randomly gave me and my brother HeroQuest. Oh, uh, so so many. It's it's funny because as soon as people say HeroQuest now, I want to jump into that um, the Bardic whatever reviews. The best thing about HeroQuest is <laughs> <laughs> I just hear that in my head now. I just see a huge beard and a man talking about what the best thing about HeroQuest is. So the best thing about HeroQuest is that Giga Robo got made because of HeroQuest. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, when I, when I was a kid, I had no idea how to play it though. Like me and my brother tried to decipher it, but we were just really, I mean, I mean, you open up a box and it's just like filled with incredible wonderment and you just have the miniatures and you've got, you know, the doors and you've got just so much 3D pieces and so immersive. Making um, dungeons was like half that game. We just made dungeons oh, yeah. forever. We never really oh, played yeah. the game. We just built dungeons that were like impossible to go through. <laughs> That's the best part. Put, put a monster uh, in every single square. That was the, that yeah, was the exactly. only answer. Yeah. Um, I think it was also, I forget if it was the bookshelves or which component that we could, I could never get, like I put, to, I didn't put together correctly in the beginning and I think I tried to super glue it and it like ruined it forever. And it was just like this bane. <laughs> and I was like, anyway, but uh, so then um, fast forward many, many years, uh, actually when I was graduating college, uh, two of my friends uh, who, very close friends, but for some reason I just never really knew that they were so into tabletop gaming and they were actually big Warhammer 40k fans, they uh, just invited me to come over one night to play Hero Quest again. Um, and that kind of just totally steamrolled. Like, I didn't even remember it uh, when they mentioned the name. And I saw it on the table, and it was just like this huge flash of memories. And uh, right. then that steamrolled because then that led me into being like, well, maybe we can take a step further. And then I bought Descent. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it's then a we also spiritual like successor to, to Warhammer Quest and Hero Quest. Yeah. Uh, and then I asked them, I was like, well, what step do we take past there? And they're like, well, we're really past this. You start playing Dungeons and Dragons. I was like, okay, let's play Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> uh, which is funny because it's such a, like a, such a stigma growing up. It's like some epitome of nerd culture. But I was like, it, it is so really, cool. yeah, it's, it's funny how you, because um, I had friends in high school that I didn't realize played miniature games too. And yeah. it was almost like a secret club. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, like it was yeah. almost like, um, like uh, you're a member of the underground. You had to have secret handshakes or like some kind of things. You didn't want anybody to know that you were into that stuff. <laughs> Uh, I used to have this T-shirt um, that I got. We we made it for a big GW event in two thousand and five, maybe, and it was basically just a black T-shirt, but it had a stat line across the front of it for for a Space Marine for in Warhammer forty thousand, and it just said M four WS four bit. Like, so if you're just like a layman, you have no idea what this means. It's just it's just random letters yeah. and numbers. But like, if you knew. And I would be on like the, the subway, like the TTC in Toronto, and like random, you know, lawyers in suits would just come up and be like, that t-shirt's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're part of this like club. Uh, 
um and yeah even dnd i think it's the same way like you get you get these like it, it's almost like a code and that's how you see these weird these weird things in dnd now too where you find it these really famous or like influential people were like huge fans of dnd and like the like the that was the most recent one the most recent edition of dnd had stephen colbert right the the forward to it about how like influential it was in his life and stuff that's awesome yeah and it, it uh it kind of it, that kind of opened my eyes up to i guess just the more creative elements of gaming just because of you know you have such a, a natural narrative that starts emerging between you and your friends and um i'm i'm a filmmaker also and so i mean storytelling is kind of in my blood and that so that was kind of like emerging of these two interests and then that kind of directly turned into me wanting to design games because as soon as after playing dnd i was like i want to I want to be like a GM. I want to run a session. I have a story to write. And I, you know, I took, I actually took a film script I had written and I turned that into a campaign and, uh, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, and that, that kind of is how it started. Um, yeah. And then you're, you're asking about the, the mission we're on. Yeah. What do you guys want to like, what is it you guys want to do? What is it? What is it that cardboard denim was out to make? You know, if you're going to define your brand, what are you trying to do? If I'm gonna define my brand, um, or if you haven't thought about it yet, we could totally ask that no, question later. No, 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 I've got it. I've got <laughs> okay, it. Uh, it's, it's, it's so important. It feels so weighty. No, it's um, fair. Yeah, I I think that cardboard dynamo's goal is to create. Um, this might sound pretentious. To create thematically uncompromised games, um, in the sense that. I think all the designs we're working on, and I think especially starting with Giga Robo, kind of like the the pillar of design when we started, was that we said, okay, we want to make this game. We want the theme to justify every mechanic, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but we want the mechanics to breathe life into the theme. Like we wanted to balance between those two ideas. Um, we didn't want to like kind of draw a line where I mean, I mean at least me personally, like it's uh, I, don't know, I, I wish I wish kind of that the hobby wasn't in this place where it's like, oh, is it thematic? Is it abstract? Is that it? Like, I, I kind of I wish there was like a space for people to just embrace things like a game is a game. It is what it is. Yeah, you don't have to try, don't have to, try to overanalyze it. Just enjoy it. Let it kind of go over you. Yeah, well, let me tell you, if you want to use the word uncompromising again, I think that would be a, a, a very fair assessment because you, you everything in Giga Robo, having handled the components and played the game, um, it drips with this Saturday morning cartoon thing. Like, they're, half the words for, like, the combos, I just can't even pronounce. Like, when you see the video, because you won't have seen it yet, I just butcher every name. Like, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And that feels like the point. You know what I mean? That, like, you, you're actually sitting there and you're enjoying trying to figure out how to say the names of half these things. Because it's all made up anyway. You know what I mean? Like, or, or most of it's made up. Yeah. And so it's just this, like... It it felt just like I'm standing on a schoolyard with a bunch of my eight year old friends, having just watched like an episode of Ultraman, trying to figure out what the heck the name of the bad guy was because it's this like seven syllable word that I can't pronounce. <laughs> That's a good segue though, because because this game is set in like a Saturday morning cartoon style universe, and there's a lot of like there's a lot of that in my life. So a lot of the Gen X Y kids kind of grew up with that. So like. If you were to say so, so that uncompromising view. What's it colored by? What's where have you drawn inspiration from for this setting? Like, what's the what's the games, the art, and the books, and the movies that you love that you pulled into this? Um, I I think the kind of like the hallmark. So I mean, I be ever since starting this project, I've just become obviously. I was I was a huge like giant robot manga and anime fan before. Uh, and I probably just mispronounced that language. Manga. <laughs> God, I'm just uh, great. All my cred's gone. Um, but I was, I was like a huge fan before, but then jumping into the game, I kind of made it an obsessive mission to just see every single corner because I just wanted to make sure I wasn't doing kind of a disrespect to the genre. Right. Um, so, but I would say like overall, absolute favorite is um, Get a Robo by Ken Ishikawa and Go Nagai. Cool. Um, uh, the manga especially um it's it kind of has all these wonderful trappings for like as a kid show uh it's like it's about three teenagers they are all in these different uh jets and they combine into three different robots depending on like who's in what orientation who's on top who's in the middle who's on bottom right um i'm on and, the wikipedia page right now by the way so oh, yeah. you just keep going i'm gonna fact check this whole okay. thing for you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and their their enemies. This oh, it's my favorite part. Their enemies are the dinosaur empire, which is 
I, I'm I looking at right a, a civilization of reptile-like humanoids who evolved from the now extinct dinosaurs. That's amazing. It's so good. It's <laughs> so good. Um, but then there's something really interesting that happens there, and I think Ken Ishikawa and Gonagai's work. Um, so Gonagai also did. Uh, he's like the essentially the most prolific uh, kind of super robot designer. He did uh, Mazinger Z. He did. Right. Uh, um, yeah, you did get a robo, all of their different iterations. Uh, yeah, there's like the, there's like ten here. Yeah, there's it's like, like get a robo go, Shin get a robo, get a robo arc, Hien, yeah. Ap Apocrypha, get a robo dash. Some of these names just get better and better. There's one that's literally seven words. It's Shin get a robo, Shin get a robo Armageddon. <laughs> I'm like, that's the name. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's so good. You're right. It was really good. <laughs> Um, so, so one thing about that, I think that's, that's kind of influenced the game in a major way, even though I've like, there's been so much of this I've become immersed in and was immersed in before starting the project is that, uh, so in Get a Robo, um, the central conceit is that you have to be insane to pilot a giant robot. Yeah. Like, like you have to be completely mad the entire concept. So like it starts off and you see the test pilots and the test pilots are actually going crazy and they're like in the jets and they're like vomiting because it's so intense. And then what happens is that there's, uh, of course, uh, a great inventor behind the robot, uh, Satomi, and he finds the three teenagers and they're all these completely like bonkers, violent, misanthropic maniacs. Um, they're kind of completely repugnant in this way that I think it's that's just not... a common theme in giant robot stuff. Like the people are always flawed. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and really deeply flawed. Like, I feel like there might be some other, there, there's some other kind of iterations of the genre where you kind of have more classic hero archetypes and things like that. Yeah. 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 Um, but then you get to like Evangelion, it's just kids crying for like, oh my God. Like, why am I watching this? Like, <laughs> why is this so popular? I thought it was watch it like a dozen times and I'm like, I just can't watch this kid cry anymore. Like, it's just too weird. Yeah. I just feel bad. Yeah. But when you're when you're like a teenager watching it, you're like, I have no idea what this means, but it, it, it speaks means to something. Me. It speaks <laughs> it to me. Speaks to, it's meaningful. It's it's powerful. Yeah. It's like, I, but I don't know what it means, but it's 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 like it's like the longest non-narrative film ever made. So uh, so so are you a big fan of of humanoid mecha? Like is that your thing? Because it seems like all the influences so far on the 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 man scale mecha, not sort of more like the um the Shirao mecha, which are all kind of insects. Because yeah. there's kind of two schools of that I found in 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 manga, where there's there's the ones who are trying to make robots look like people, and there's ones trying to make robots that look like they could actually work. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I think I'm more towards the the former camp. Um, I'm kind of in, in general. I'm a really big fan of these kind of uh, cleaner, kind of chunkier designs that are from like the '70s, mm -hmm. early '80s. Mm -hmm. Like really big, colorful. Where the idea is that it's like it's not. It doesn't have to be like a realistic machine. It's that it's like something that's. It's like the the robot is really an extension of the pilot. Right. It's a character yeah. unto itself. Like it's a superhero essentially. It's uh, funny because it, it's almost like the Marvel versus DC thing. I've always found that those two camps, the 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 sort of humanoid mecha, it's all very light and and fun sort of in the design so it's got a kind of marvel feel to it whereas yeah. the dark kind of dc brooding batman-y stuff with like the stuff that was always about like politics or it was always about like um the the human condition like that that sort of mecca was always the the insectoid it could be real life like um shirao or um what's the other one? Oh, the guy that did oh not macros the other ones although well, macros are kind of in between i guess because it's half and yeah. half yeah, they 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 don't they it's I feel like it has the trappings of like the real robot genre, mm -hmm. um, but there's definitely so many other larger than life things. That's cool. Yeah. Okay, so so what about your hook then? So it, what are the top three things that make you excited about this game you're designing, and and what do you think people are going to get coming back to it? Right. So so I guess what I mean when I say that is, um, you, you've got you've got the the main hook obviously is giant robots, like that's the one we've talked about so far. Yeah. But what's the things that you've put into the game now? If we talk, sort of take the aesthetics out of it, we talk about the game itself. Um, what are the hooks that you're going to have that are going to get people playing it and then coming back and playing it? Um, I think at that level, uh, one of the main hooks I think is just player customization. I really just wanted to imbue the game uh, with just that kind of 
sense of customization and personalization and kind of discovery. Like when you're mixing and matching pilots and robots, you're, you know, experimenting, even getting to like kind of min max level, but you get to a point where like, you know, you have your hand, you've gone through all the decks, you've, you've gone to the abilities and then like, there's something that feels really personal. Um, and kind of supporting that by hopefully we'll be able to release more and more content for it and more expansions. Mm -hmm. uh, so people just, I mean, it's sort of in the, in the same sense of a CCG, a deck building game, almost. Uh, yeah, yeah, where you just you just have this like awesome wealth of options, and it's funny because I can, I can confirm that that worked on Owen because as yeah. soon as we played the game that you watched, he was like, "I got to figure it out. I got to do it. There's got to be a way. There's got to be a thing." And he just went back. He's like, "I got to play some more game Robo. I got to figure out this game." <laughs> and and oh. it, there definitely is a certain psychology where it if you present them with a complex equation. And they can't resolve it right away. They're going to keep coming back and coming back to that equation and try and get the best out of it that they can. And that's I, I, I that doesn't that's not necessarily my personal hook, but it, I mean it's part of the pie chart of the things I like. But it it definitely is Owen's like big slice of his personal hobby. Um, and I just watched that part of the game reel him in. Like you you had him hooked from like the beginning, and he just completely. Um, fell in love with the idea of like it's a miniature game and I get to make choices on the table but then even pre-game I get to make choices to try and go in and optimize what I'm doing and it felt a bit like um, you'd made a miniature version of a fighting game like Street Fighter where there's, oh, a yeah. list, there's a combos right so you get your combos listed in Street Fighter and you always have your strategy guy they talk about that um, yeah. but then everybody plays characters differently and that's that's almost the joy of it. You know what I mean? Is that you can have two people and they can use the same guys. So they can use the same pilot and the same robot, I guess, in this case. But they wouldn't necessarily play them the same way. Yeah, yeah. I think that's also just from being at like uh, demoing at conventions and even just playing with friends. One of my favorite things is to see that, like when when you have two people who come together and they're playing the same pilot and the same robot, and it's completely different. Like the base stats might be the same, but they've they're thinking about their strategies in these completely different ways that have kind of abstracted from each other is just like I don't know, it's really gratifying. Um I mean just because like I don't know, just being able to provide that kind of experience for somebody and just seeing them have so much fun is just obviously it's I don't know, it, it's it just feels great. Like I'm just really yeah. happy to be able to help like do that for somebody. But um yeah. I don't know, just that that sense of ownership that like a player can find in it. Uh that's that's I guess ultimately coming back to in terms of the hook, that's that's one of the hooks for me, uh, is that a player should be able to come to Giga Robo, and I think they can come to Giga Robo and kind of feel like they they own their combination of pilot and robot. That's awesome, and you did talk about um, some kind of intention stuff there, where you could go wider, you could go deeper. You know, you could by wider I mean expanding the options. So you you you, you introduce new pilots and new robots. You even have some of that in the Kickstarter from the stretch goals. Yeah. And then when I say deeper. Uh, you know, adding new options to the palace that already exists. So, so new cards, new combos, stuff like that. It, it's cool that you've left the room there so that it's never solved. <laughs> yeah. There's never going to be a, this is the best Giga Robo because Giga Robo year two, or actually you, you have to use some of these like style names, Giga Robo alpha shin Giga Robo <laughs> Giga uh, Robo arc. I'm, I'm neither confirming nor denying. I, I'm calling it right now. I'll call, I don't care who's listening to this. Point. It's happening. <laughs> G G Giga Robo G will be the next one, then go, then Shin Giga Robo. I'm, you heard it here first, people. I'm calling it dollars to donuts. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've, I've seen inside your soul. I know what's in there. <laughs> so, so let's talk about the pilots then. You've got four initial pilots in this game, right? There's um, a brief blurb you could do, I guess, about each one. So, so pick the four different pilots and tell me what kind of player you think will riff off that, right? So, like, if this is the kind of and you can even use stuff people know about it's like a street fighter reference you know what i mean like if yeah. a pilot has like a comparison out there tell me it that way yeah I, th I think starting with dash who we actually we actually just say we're doing some official updates where we're posting little strategic abstracts and also giving their full like narrative backstory on cool. kickstarter we just released the first one with dash today um so dash um I'm trying to think so in terms of fighting game terms i think fat he's really good at like mix-ups. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, he's got a ton of fighting spirit gain and threshold. Um, so he has the highest heart in the game, and heart is uh, the, in the beginning of your turn, that's the amount of fighting spirit you can gain to use mm -hmm. to spend for attacks. Um, yeah, there's like active heart and reactive heart too, I found, because um, what's his name? Not Dash. Oh, the one I was playing with. Uh, 
Takashi, yeah. He yeah. he has all the reactive heart, so he's he tanks damage and then and then gets mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're they're they really juxtapose each other in their strategies. So yeah, so Dash Dash is kind of like um to use more of a, a collectible card game term, he's kind of like a control character. He's got a lot of little he's got a ton of counters, he's got a lot of ways to mitigate dice, things like that. Um, but then he has this really good backbone of just fighting fighting spirit gain. So I think for players who want to be able to like just have a kind of constant floating sense of control, like knowing like I can, you know, I'm gonna have the ability to counter my opponent's instant card. I'm gonna have the ability to mitigate their dice and mitigate my own dice um, and kind of have that flow are gonna really right. dig into dash. Um, then I think, so the pilot you played, Takashi, Takashi is, I'm trying to think, I think, yeah, I feel like if you're going to use Street Fighter terms, his best comparison would probably be Blanca. Um, awesome. Takashi is like just such a kind of relentlessly aggressive character. And like you said before, he's kind of built to be reactive. So the opposite of heart in this case, heart is the, the, what you can choose at the beginning of your turn. You can instead choose rage, which is whenever you get damage from your opponent's attack, you can collect rage, which dictates a different amount of like, spirit. So it's funny because in the game. So not knowing a lot about anything going in, we kind of just randomly picked fighters and robots for our first game. And you'll see this uh, on Tuesday, um, mm -hmm. which will be in the past now when you guys, when everyone else is listening to this. But I picked Dairajin 5 as his robot, which is like the least tanky robot. <laughs> I'm playing the pilot that wants to get hit. Um, and then it's funny because right afterwards, having figured that out, I picked Ogun as my robot for, and it, and it just blended like seamlessly. I'm like, oh, you have melee boosts, and this guy's got range one to four melee fists. <laughs> like, this goes together really well. Um, but it does. It is interesting because because especially like in these two juxtaposed pilots we're talking about, I think that their robot selection. We'll talk about robots after this, but their robot selection becomes like really important. And there's some kind of obvious pairings and uh, and sort of maybe more subtle pairings that that you can think about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, just a quick note um, for Dairajin, we we kind of internally refer to him as Dairajin V. That's a reference Ooh. to one specific robot, but gotcha. it's also purposefully there as a Roman numeral for five. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get it wrong forever. Remember that. <laughs> it's, it's because there's, it's built into like multiple giant, like super robot references. But, um, <laughs> yeah. oh, that, oh, that's, that's great. So yeah, it's an, so Takashi is, is really kind of relentlessly on the offense he's kind of built. So you can be in your opponent's face all the time. And you can be taking hits, and then you're just going to hit them back even harder. Um, because his rage is so high, and he has so many different instant cards that are about kind of increasing the amount of power tokens you can get, and increasing damage, and also just taking damage. Um, he's good to just stick in your opponent's face and kind of not back off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then uh, if we go to Hadrian, Hadrian Corto. Hadrian is uh, a way more defensively minded um, character. Uh, so if we go back to the Street Fighter 2 thing, I think, and Blanca is a charge character also, but thinking about characters kind of like M. Bison or Guile, where like you're mm -hmm. kind of backing off and then and then lashing back out. Uh, he he kind of provides for a pretty paced game. He's got a ton of ways to mitigate damage, mitigate uh, trauma tokens in the game, um, and just a lot of defensive abilities. And then he also has some cool, his pilot abilities are or like an interesting compliment to him. He has a focus on increasing mobility with a robot. Um, so his entire character is like, he's this robot engineer, uh, like right. making modifications on the fly. And uh, we kind of wanted to own that, that sense of his character with his cards and everything like that. He had a lot of repair abilities too, I saw. There's just yeah. a ton of ways for him to put armor back on the robot yeah. um, by shutting down. So, but I guess, I, I mean, I visualized it actually when, when it was being done is by shutting down systems because you're discarding yeah. cards right to do it so he's, yeah. he's shutting down systems to divert power or you know that arm that's half broken he just lets it fall off or whatever it is oh, ex exactly yeah we, we wanted to kind of keep that, that i mean I'm, I'm so happy that comes across because that's what we wanted we wanted that that idea that like you know he's he's kind of adapting to the situation it's like yeah. oh, this isn't working cut it off let's reroute power now this is what we're going to focus on to win the fight yeah exactly yeah. and then there's a uh, noriko uh, Noriko is, uh, I guess if you're going to make the, the, the Street Fighter analogy, Noriko is kind of like, more of like a Ryu. Like, re her stats are like super balanced um, across the board in terms of heart and rage and power. She, she has by far the most balanced of any character. And 
her cards and her style is she's more about you know, kind of keeping a fluid play style for combat. Like she can add different attack modifiers to cards. She can add different ways of doing forced movement to different attacks. So you can normally have an attack that wouldn't push or throw an opponent, and she's able to do that. She looked like the most versatile when it came to piloting, too. Like you could almost pick any of the four initial robots, and she'd have a different way of piloting them from everyone else, but she wouldn't suffer from picking any of the four. Like she'd, she'd be able to sort of like offer something to all four of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think they all offer the all the pilots. I mean, they're all designed to be interchangeable. Right, right. Um, right. But yeah, but her stats, I think, and her abilities are. Yeah, I, I think there's never a trade off. You know what I mean? You're not trading exactly, off yeah. one ability to to focus on other camp abilities or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then she, her abilities uh, are all about sacrificing things at the same time, um, which I think one of the larger things we wanted to do is that we wanted to create different strategies into each deck, but at the same time, we wanted them to be versatile. But we had a big focus on the pilot abilities themselves, kind of tying into who the characters were, like their right. sense of personality. Um, so her entire thing is that she's basically such an extremely powerful fighter that she's, and she's so, such a skilled pilot, she's like almost too good for the machine she's using. She's, she's, she's like pushing it to its breaking point. Right. Yeah. Um, Overextending it, shattering past its capabilities, and exactly, blowing yeah. parts of it off in the meantime. Yeah, like breaking, just breaking all of its limits. Right. And legs, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what about the robots then? So those, those are four pilots. How do the four robots in the box, the ones you're starting off with, um, affect like how you choose your pilot and how you play the game? So, just like yeah, just like the pilots, they all have their own distinct personalities. So I guess starting from the top, we've got uh, Eisen. I knew it was um, Aizen. Azim? <laughs> Azim, yeah. Aizen. I call, we call it both in the videos we did. Because <laughs> we're just like, I don't know. Neither of us know. What do we do? We just call it whatever we call it. Just be consistent. And then we're not consistent throughout the entire video. <laughs> it's, 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 it's good. It's part, part of the, it's part of the user experience. It is. It is part of the user <laughs> experience. Um, yeah. Aizen's like... So he's the biggest robot in the roster. And he's just this massive Hulk. Basically, he's the slowest robot, um, but he's also, in many ways, the most powerful when it comes to like melee range. So, if I would say, if you're a player who really likes kind of like paced combat and like just knowing, oh, if my opponent gets in range of me, like he's going down. Yeah, um, he, he felt like the Zangief. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> like doing, yeah, like doing grab attacks and things yeah. like that, like massive close quarters damage. Um, in terms of picking a pilot with Aizen. Uh, everybody kind of adds their own flavor, their own modifications. Uh, but for example, uh, so Steven Hammerschlag, the, the co-developer, his favorite combo is is Hadrian Corto and Eisen, specifically because uh, Hadrian, his abilities overcome Eisen's natural slowness. Yeah, um, his, his deficits. Yeah, they complement each other. Yeah, like he become, becomes really intimidating. Like when you expect a face, you know, Eisen, who's speed four, and you're like, okay, I can maybe hit and run. You know, I, you can, I, I, a lot of ways, I kind of, when I've been designing it, I, I work, I look towards kind of like, obviously the, the genre itself, uh, but also a lot towards boxing and like just thinking about it as an actual fight. Mm -hmm. um, it is an arena. I mean, you've, you've literally yeah. made an octagon. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> um, yeah. And so Hadrian's really good at, at boosting uh, speed. So immediately, like when you pair Hadrian and Aizen, you have the abilities to boost Aizen's speed by two, which becomes extremely intimidating when you speed six and kind of all of a sudden dashing across the board uh, um, and you start running away uh, or your opponent starts running away. Right. And then he also has the ability to uh, sacrifice cards to gain this ability boost, which allows you to ignore elevation levels when you're moving. Oh, wow. Uh, so, I mean, that's a little more defensively minded because you can be like pushed your back against the wall, against a bunch of structures and be really vulnerable, but against potentially being pushed through them. But he can, he's so big, he can just like literally clamber over them. Yeah. There's that, them. What's that one move where he hits you and then jumps to where you are and then pushes you down? The iron, iron Meteor? Oh, yeah, it's amazing. We, we did it, I think both games ended up happening, and yeah. he ended up landing on top of the building, and the building immediately <laughs> collapsed underneath him, and he was just like up to his waist in the water or fire or something. And I was, it was really visually enjoyable. I'm, I'm so glad. We were, when we designed that card and we were testing it, we were just like, 
laughing over and over again, but like the different things about him, like basically like sumo jumping. And then all of a sudden he's like, yeah, it's like neck deep in fire, just kind of staring at the other robot. Awkward. That was basically, I just imagine it was a frog splash. Like he literally yeah, just much. like went like arms and legs straight open and just tackled the building and guy at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So then one of my, another, uh, one of my favorite combinations to do, one of my favorite builds is doing uh, Noriko and Ogun. Um, and those naturally complement because uh, Ogun has the highest armor in the game and Noriko has these abilities where she's, the idea is she's driving her robot past its breaking point, right? And she can trade, you can inflict damage to your robot to gain buffs basically, or you can even start the game with lower armor to gain buffs. So she can find a natural complement with Ogun because Ogun can basically take it. He's like yep. a short, stocky, super tough, like kind of classic strongman build. He's the dwarf. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's, he's, like, he's, so, he's yeah. Krillin is what yeah. he is. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he can take the hits. Uh, he can take the hits that, that kind of Noriko uh, wants to use. Often. Yeah. I, in my in my own experience, I found that uh, Takashi was the same way because he wants to take damage. Ogun and him were naturally complementary. Um, and I was playing against um, oh, what's his name? The robot with the sword. Um, Chogo King. Uh, Shug yeah, Chogo King. Uh, we called him Chogo King. Chogo King. Chogo King. Is that it? Okay. It's, it's um, a play on a, a term called Chogo King, which is it's back to Mazinger Z. It means <laughs> owl. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of references built in. That's fine. And there's a lot of me getting them wrong. It's going to be great. Um, but, um, his, his proclivity of making fire uh, yeah. meant that, like, I was, I was ramping up, like, 20 uh, uh, fighting spirit every turn because I ended up getting hit, being placed on fire, getting my 8 for rage, getting my 8 for starting in fire, and then getting 4 from the start of the turn for heart, and just going bananas every single time. And Ogun was fantastic, because with 45 armor, he didn't really care about all the chip damage that was coming from fire, because I, I wasn't dying fast enough to stop just doing, like, chain attacks over and over and over and over. Yeah, yeah. No, they, de they, definitely, uh, they, they definitely find a really nice complement with each other. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. And then... Um, so then there's Dairajin V or Dairajin 5. Dairajin V? It doesn't Dairagin matter, whichever one. I love that even the designer can't decide. That makes me happy. <laughs> no, I feel slightly I'm less saying, bad. Yeah, internally, Dairajin V is what we refer to him as. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. Not going not to dive into the rabbit hole of references. Yeah. Um, but Dairajin V, um, I think, can pair really well with Dash. Uh, and one of my favorite uh, m combinations to use is Dash has a pilot ability, which lets you raise um, all of your recovery roll results uh, by three. Um, oh, wow. And Dairajin V has a few really powerful recovery roll abilities. So normally a recovery roll is by far, it can be the most random element of the game. Yeah, 50-50, 50-50 pretty much yeah. for the whole thing. Actually a little bit worse than 50-50. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can choose to add to spend power tokens to add power dice to that role, like you right. can do it in any any of the games, so you can mi mitigate that naturally. But with Dairajin's guaranteed plus three, or sorry, with Dash's guaranteed plus three, all of a sudden those tactics, which are the reason they're built out that way to be a recovery role, is because they're so powerful. Um, yep. It just allows you to make them really aggressively and very consistently. Yeah, seventy percent chance of passing is really good. It's better, yeah. even better if you throw a power dice in there. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then also because Dyrage and V is so combo focused, uh, Dash is really good at just constantly funding those combos. Basically, mm -hmm. this fighting spirit. You can constantly be driving Dyrage and V to, you know, you can be playing combo after combo, turn after turn, uh, and not have to worry about, you know, the extent of, that you're exhausting your fighting spirit. So then uh, Takashi with Chigoking, uh, like you mentioned before, they, they also find there was a lot of really fun combos to be built in and with those two characters uh, not only because like you're saying before taking taking damage uh taking damage you know takashi has this really high rage value so he's always getting resources back and then if you start your turn in an inferno which is something that Chigoking is naturally creating on his turn uh you're going to be able to kind of trigger the effects from infernos which if you're starting on an inferno tile you can gain rage at the beginning of your turn um so and then not only that, because the fire, taking fire, Chigokin can naturally use fire tokens 
uh, as a kind of micro currency within his character build. He can use them for like utility and offense and defense. And yeah, there's a lot of triggers actually. You, you get damage buffs based on how many fires you had on your um, your track, how many trauma tokens you had. Yeah. Uh, so the two of them kind of match that because his and all the strategies with fire and Shigoking are naturally, you know, it's doing chip damage. There's a natural danger to it. And if you're not careful, you can overwhelm yourself with fire. Um, but then Takashi is already built to be taking this damage anyway. So they're just like this, they're just pushing forward. Living on the edge. <laughs> Living on the edge. <laughs> yeah. it. It's, um, what was the, what was the game? Was it Capcom versus SNK where you're, there were certain characters that built their special bars for taking damage or something like that. It felt like that guy. Oh, there, was, yeah. there was some game where their special bar, I remember, just got exploded the more damage they took. And so, like, the, the closer they were to death, the more likely they were to get off their, like, three-player super combo, where you yeah. get hit by, like, Wolverine, followed by Ryu, followed by, you know, like, by whatever it was. Yeah. No, it was definitely, yeah, I know there's Street Fighter games where there, there's the same thing. I think Samurai Showdown also. But, yep, that was right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Samurai Showdown. Oh, I used to, there's a, a gaming store. I used to go to in Toronto, and they had the cabinet that was Samurai Showdown um, and Marvel vs. Capcom like in the same cabinet, like one of those dual cabinets. And I wasted like oh, a good chunk things. of my life there. That was, it was really bad. <laughs> no, I miss, I miss Neo Geo. Neo Geo was, yes. There's most of the kids listening as well. Have no idea what we're talking about, but you, you know, <laughs> and I know, and some of you out there are going to get it. You're going to understand the reference. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you've clearly put a lot of uh, work into like the art and the component quality. Can you, can you tell me more about that? The art is just uh, completely on point for the theme. Um, and the components too, like they, they look like they're pulled right out of the Saturday morning cartoon. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, from the very beginning, I, I, I definitely wanted to start with the kind of 70s super robot aesthetic. Like I was talking about before, with like, you know, big clean lines and not erring so much on, not feeling like you need to be anchored to realism. Like you can be a little more expressive with the designs, but at the end of the day, it's still a robot. Um, so I started with that. That was like really the, the starting point for designing all the robots. And I was working with, um, Andrew Chan, who's the uh, he's like the chief mechanical designer of the game. We we were designing, collaborating together on the initial robots, um, and we we are still working on expansion robots too, actually. Um, and we were really just sourcing from everything. We we brought our own favorite robots to the table, and we were thinking about ways we can pay homage, and you know what? Just there's it's when you get so deep into the genre, it's like it gets to a point where you can like almost you know you become a fanatic of details. Right, right. Like you can say, like, like with Ogun, which you know can tie in with like the with uh, Gunbuster or the the Zaku from Gundam, like the Mono Eye. Like, you know, there are just fans who love the Mono Eye, and like, yeah. in the beginning, and I was like, I really want a Mono Eye robot. Like, that's very important to me. There was there was something with his proportions, and I don't think this is the wrong way, but he immediately he immediately made me think of the big samurai pizza cat. <laughs> 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 like, like, just the way he was built. Like, it was something about like you could just draw him with circles. You know what I mean? I'm That's so so happy you just referenced Sam Pizza Cat. You're welcome. I like to make you. Feel, I like to make my guests feel welcome on this, this segment. This is you know I want to speak your language. Oh. Um, but yeah, I know he immediately made me think of like the big tubby one that always had a hard time getting in the yeah. gun and being yeah. fired in the gun. Yeah, that was that was right. That's, that's that's what I got out of it. I mean, you got Mon Eye and all kinds of details. I got Big Samurai Pizza Cat. Um, um, you know, everyone's going to take something from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that was actually that was actually uh, one of the intentions is that while we didn't we didn't want homage to necessarily dominate the designs, we did want to find that kind of familiarity. So if you were already a fan of the genre, you're going to kind of immediately notice some of these details, and you're going to you know you'll, you'll gravitate to. There'll, there'll be yeah. one that you gravitate towards, even the yeah. colors, because because I mean I painted the 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 pre the pre release the prototypes that you sent me, and I think I got a big compliment because someone was like, "Are those the are those the official miniatures? Or that's what they're gonna look like in the box?" And I was like, "I just I just painted these. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is just me painting, guys." Um, and even the color choices, because I just tried to match what was in your rule book, you you could almost you could almost feel the the sort of like personality of the robot just by their colors. You know, like you look at a zine or Azen and you're like, this guy's menacing. This guy's a bad guy. Like he looks like the undertaker, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, whereas you look at um, Ogun and he looks like the scrappy little dwarf. You know what I mean? Like he looks like yeah. the United's. He's he's in good guy colors. And that's not just because I'm Canadian. He's mostly white and red, but, um, <laughs> but he's, there's definitely like a, um, 
there's a there's a personality in, in all the choices you made, not just the, the aesthetic sculpting details, but even the color themes. You can certainly put some of the robots' personalities sort of like in the, the visual. You'll immediately gravitate towards one if that's if that evokes something in you. Thank you. Yeah. It's, so yeah, I guess it just it really started with there. Um, in terms, of, and we we also knew there was kind of like an aesthetic. Like we wanted the originally, or from the very beginning, we wanted like we wanted the look of cell animation. We wanted it to look like you were seeing all the cards were a, a single cell from. That's really the goal. Right. We also we wanted it to be big and colorful. We didn't want anything to be uh, really. We didn't want desaturated elements. Um, which uh, speaking of which, if I if if I go on a, a tangent really quick. Um, so right now we have the board uh, and the robots and everything's very gray. The board right now is actually temp. We're still building out the elements. We're adding greenery. We're adding right. unique elements. And we're also adding more structure variations. So it's not just going to be the two types of structures in the game. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, there's going to be multiples. But yeah, we, we want it to be like big yeah. and bright and colorful and fun and engageable. Um, we want it to be really approachable. Like we didn't really, we, did, we, we wanted to keep any sense of grit mainly in the maybe the pilot's backstories right but well, you leave yourself open there too i mean it does it does really feel like these robots are in you know downtown happyville and they're making a mess of it yeah. <laughs> but but you've got i mean that, that gives you license later on um to do just different settings you know like if yeah. you do the alien expansion at some point you could have like a moonscape with rock spires or you know whatever it is like it doesn't have to be buildings it's just got to be a big obstruction and these guys and you know however you want to do it like you you've got all kinds of design space there to to make the game different the, the user experience different based on that stuff too in the future yeah yeah there's a lot there's a lot, a lot of different directions we can take it so so what's one thing that you really want folks to know then about your project like if you were as a message you want everybody to leave this sort of like chat with um what's the thing that you would want the people listening to know about you guys and your project and what you're making i i would say that the number one thing we want people to know is that uh we're putting our heart and soul into it and we adore it and we also we are also gamers and tabletop fans and miniature wargaming fans and we we want i think in many ways the same things as most people want from it we want the highest quality components we want it to be thoughtfully designed from not only the you know the cards you're handling but to the insert in the box and things like that um and that yeah like we this is this is a really a labor of love we've been developing it and self-funding it for years now um and we're going to really we're just going to make it the best game we can make it uh, and we're also going, we've been listening to the community and we're going to continue listening to the community and we want, you know, we want it to be kind of refined by everybody. We want, we want it to be something that when we're, when like, you know, this Kickstarter is said and done and, you know, hopefully we're funded, we're sitting at something that like, you know, it feels like almost a community collaboration at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now there's no, there is no better stress testing than putting it in front of a couple thousand people and have them try and break it. Yep. Cool. Well, that's awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Alex. Um, I hope everyone out there listening, you guys enjoyed this. Uh, if you want any more information about the game or go check out the crowdfund, there will be information in the video description below. So just click a link uh, and you can check it out. Uh, I'll have links as well to my video um, from this week, the Let's Play on Giga Robo. Now, do bear in mind, we get stuff wrong because it's Let's Play. We're going to get stuff wrong. But if you want to get a feel for the game um, and just watch two people cracking it open having a great time, um, it's a great episode. And then also um, you can see the second game, which has already aired, um, even beforehand, which was Owen from Game with the Cooler and myself playing another game of it. Uh, and you can get some first-hand sort of taste of what the game is like. So thanks for watching. Thanks, Alex, for coming on. Uh, we'll see you guys from the Witches Wonders in the future. Until then, Ash, happily.